as I mentioned when we were looking at the other machine, we had built a version after that called the Model 1403 Model 3 that moved the speed from 600 lines a minute to 1100 lines a minute. The next iteration of that was this product called the 1403 N1 was updated where they were completely enclosed in covers for the acoustic to cut down on the noise from the printing and, and to match other machines that were in the 360 family at the time. So this was basically repackaging packaging the print mechanism for 1403 Model 3 at 1100 lines a minute into this machine with a new set of covers for acoustics and looks so forth. This printer is 1100 lines a minute and has the same paper handling uh, tractors, spacing, adjustments, and so forth. Again, still driven by a hydraulic unit on it. So that's, a, that's the same. You'd space paper at 20 milliseconds to space one line. That's what it was. And it had the capability for big long skips if the electronics called for it. Just turn it on and run the tractors. So. That, that was standard from the 1403 Model 1, 2, Model 3, and the N1 models. The difference here on the, for the speed, we have a different hammer unit behind the paper. You still have the hammer faces in the same 100,000 centers, 132 characters wide, but we had paper compressors to squeeze out the air between multiple part forms, which would take energy. These hammers were coming a lot faster in the speed, and they're a pivoted hammer driven by a magnet, and the magnet behind to reach the hammer is called a push rod. It had little urethane ends on it to, so that they wouldn't rust and, and fret high-speed operations and this so this is a separate a new hammer unit for the for the 1100 lines a minute and the other big change is the character set and the train itself this is a train and it's removable and I will show you one that's this is what that train looks like under the ribbon and as you can see there's characters, three characters per slug, and they actually are set on a monorail and they push each other around. The gear here takes them around the corner, pushes it onto the monorail. It pushes all the slugs ahead of it down here, makes this gear turn, turns the slug around and pushes it back up here. It's all driven by the one end by this gear. This is strictly an idler gear down there. So it's a one long monorail, turn it around, and push them back up. Much sturdier, less problem with chain breakage, etc. on it. And as you can see, we had different arrangements. You could put them, put them on and off. A customer could have several chains with different type slugs on them, depending on what he wanted. And he could change them depending upon the job that he was currently running. Again, these things ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Lots of, lots of paperwork, or lots of paper. So that's basically the difference. The design, different drive, uh, same, same ribbon, but because it's going faster, when you're, the type are moving faster, it would drag it more. So we had to come up with a different steering mechanism that looks at the edge of the ribbon and if it's in a certain place and going in a certain direction, it would either adjust a wobble plate here, the other ends, the idler ends of the ribbon spools would physically shift back and forth and it made a difference whether you were going that way or the ribbon was coming this way. So there was some logic behind it, what to do when you, but it always looked at the edge of the ribbon to see where see where it was and make a decision on how to steer it. This was basic that came to CT&I 
and it was a good printer, very good shape, except for one thing. For some reason or other, the idler gear between the motor and the drive gear on the chain was gone. So the first thing I had to do was figuring out what that gear was and get one made. And the local people here were very good to support me. They made me blanks. We had the gear teeth cut. They, then they had it heat treated and it's worked fine for several years now on the machine. So the local people, machine shops were very supportive in this endeavor to get this going. Given that, the printer was in very good shape. Dirty, cleaned it up, oiled things, things. And then the question was, how are you going to make it run? Because there was no electronic box to go with it. None existed, appeared in the world. We checked South America, Europe, and they had all gone to scrap or something or other by this time. We just couldn't find one. So what do you do if you want to print? The local engineers here and, and the students from SUNY Binghamton did some programming and they worked very hard and you'd, they designed and built a box to run this printer. And I can show you that here and back. Mm -hmm. So we're, we'll go around back and, this, and it's this rack, tall rack here behind here that is controlled the input we can control through a personal computer into with the proper power supplies. Again, the 60 volts that's needed comes from the outside the machine to drive the magnets. And all the control electronics is designed by the, the guys here at CT&I and, and, the, and the program was done by the students from SUNY to actually control this thing. So we can put input via the keyboard to the personal computer and actually print it out on here, whatever we want to print. So when CT and I got the printer here, as we said, we, we couldn't find any units that still existed that drove the printer in, that, in the 1960s. So the, the electrical guys and the programming decided we would make a project and actually build this to run the printer. And basically all it is is a regular, just a mechanical rack for mounting with a PC input by whoever wants to run it, running a PC, regular PC. And there's a heavy power supply down in the bottom that drives the 60 volts that's needed to actually fire the hammers. We need maybe as much as 20 amps at 60 volts to fire all the hammers as they, as they should be found. So it's a fairly heavy power supply at the bottom a few controls to turn things on and off, a few small voltages, uh, I think three volts and five volts or something or other for the electronics. And basically, the key here is this is modern electronics designed to control the printer firing and print however you want with an input of whatever the operator wants to print onto the printer. So the information comes from there, goes to there, and it drives the print hammers in the printer while it's running to print the characters. I'll slip around back here a little bit. So this is the key that was designed here that works very well. Uh, I think there's, each one of these is a drive card that will drive, I think it's five hammers, modern technology, the old SMS stuff that they used before would have two drivers per card. This is five, all programming controlled with fuses and circuit breakers. And basically that controls it from the input, tells you what to print, and it goes up to this bank up here. That's what these are. These are drive, sir, drive cables going up. And here we plugged in the real 14 the real cards that were used to actually drive the printer. They're plugged into the same kind of board. They come out, there's big cables, they go down and under the floor and up to the printer. So the, the 1960 cables are under the floor up here with SMS cards that plug into a rack. 
with new electronics plugged into this side. So this is the mating gate between new and old. And it works very well. We can print anything that we want to put in. And of course, with modern electronics and combining and stuff, you can do block printing and all sorts of things. Kids can sit at the table here and say, hi, mom, and we'll print them out a, a print on the, on the printer that says, hi, mom, in banner style. So it's quite, kids and the visitors like that feature. They, they put in their words, they print it out. So this, this was the work of the guys here in CTNI. Super job. And of course, IBM. Always think. We will load the paper. It's partially into the bottom tractors, but I will open the upper tractors and feed the paper up by hand. Make sure it goes onto the pins in the paper. Shut the tractors like so. And I will actually move it up as it would go up over the back here. And then we shut the swing casting, the print mechanism. I'm going to run it up some more so it's over in the back. To the right place, right there. I'll put it in gear. And now we'll print. We have power onto the machine. Thank you. We'll move it up a little bit. Tear off the sheet of paper. And there's a banner. <laughs>